Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out to today's important press briefing. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of Laura, a little bit of COVID, and a lot of Delta today. Um, I want to thank Ben Schott of the National Weather Service. You probably remember him uh, for the run-up to, um, to Laura. Earlier today, I declared a state of emergency in advance of Hurricane Delta's arrival. Since yesterday, and this should be lost on no one, Delta has rapidly intensified. I'm basically going from a tropical storm strength to a category four hurricane in about 16 to 20 hours. Uh, it approaches the Yucatan Peninsula as we speak. Um, it is expected to remain a major hurricane uh, when it enters the Gulf uh, and when it makes landfall in Louisiana on Friday night or on Saturday morning. Uh, the center line of the track is somewhere around the center of Louisiana. And if you look at the cone, the western edge of the cone is the western edge of Louisiana. The eastern edge of the cone is the eastern edge of Louisiana. So I can tell you that the National Weather Service is very confident right now, three and a half days in advance of landfall, that a hurricane is going to strike the state of Louisiana this week. Um, it is important to remember that the categories of hurricane uh, are measured by their sustained wind speed. Uh, and so even if there's a forecast of, of a slight weakening of the storm before landfall, understand it's a four now. Uh, so what does that mean? Is it going to be a three? Is it going to be a two? I would ask people not to focus so much on that and just to prepare for a major hurricane. And all of the uh, damaging winds, the damaging surge, um, and the, the damaging rain, uh, whether it's from flash flooding or, or river flooding uh, that hurricanes can bring. Uh, in addition, the later, I, I learned this today, if, unless I'm, I'm mistaken, the later in the year a hurricane hits, the more likely it is that it it's, uh, spawns tornadoes. And so we, we have to be looking for those as well. Um, I do also want to emphasize that no one thus right now this far out uh, in particular should be focused on the center line of the track. Uh, that storm is coming to Louisiana. Uh, somewhere uh, on our coast, it, it'll make landfall, and so don't get too focused on the center line. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. He's gonna go into much more detail. He will then stay for the rest of the briefing, and he'll be available to answer your questions uh, once, once my prepared remarks are, are concluded. Ben? Uh, thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you for everyone uh, for inviting us from the National Weather Service to be here this afternoon. Again, my name is Benjamin Schott. I'm the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service office in New Orleans, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, Delta and the impacts to the state of Louisiana. Let me see if... Oh, looks like we may not be on. Okay, that was a quick briefing. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Oh, there we go. All right. And that's why we call in the National Guard when we need him right there. Well, thank you, General. Um, so again, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Hurricane Delta. Hurricane Delta is a major hurricane. Uh, right now it is heading for the Yucatan Peninsula as a Category 4. Uh, similar to what the Governor said, I, I, at this point, uh, probably moving forward through uh, the rest of uh, Delta's uh, lifetime before it makes landfall, I don't think we should worry so much about what category is. It is going to be a major hurricane. Uh, and the impacts uh, when, of um, Delta when it comes on shore are going to be significant to the state of Louisiana. And so we're pretty certain about that track. We're pretty certain about the idea that uh, somewhere along the coastline that we will have uh, significant impacts uh, due to Hurricane Delta. Uh, some of those uh, you see listed up there, the, right now the likelihood of life-threatening storm surge. Anyone with interests along the coast uh, who don't have their uh, homes or whatever the structure uh, is elevated uh, can see significant uh, surge uh, overtake that building. And it's something that we need to obviously prepare for as we move forward. Anything loose uh, from the surge can be uh, drifted around. We saw lots of examples of that from Sally with what happened around uh, Pensacola and over towards Mobile with things uh, hitting into bridges and moving around. So 
It's, it's even the secondary things that occur from the surge that can also create a significant amount of damage. And uh, with this, it's a possibility, obviously, with a major hurricane coming towards the state. Uh, other threats are the uh, widespread damaging winds. Now, every time you have a you know, major hurricane uh, making landfall uh, where you're at, uh, the possibility of winds in, in excess of 100 miles per hour or more could be possible. Um, though there is a, the possibility of the weakening, as we mentioned earlier, um, I don't think we should keep that as something that we think is going to limit the possibility of damage or the threat to life. And so again, as the governor uh, mentioned, we definitely need to consider this as going to be a major uh, hurricane when it uh, makes landfall, most likely in the state of Louisiana. The one saving grace with uh, Delta is it may be moving fairly quickly. And so because it's moving very quickly, uh, the heavy rainfall may be a little bit more limited, but the, the threat of a heavy band setting up and creating flash flooding as well as river flooding is something that we definitely need to continue to watch. Uh, a lot of that happens on the eastern side of the storm. And so for those uh, who end up being on that side, again, that is a significant threat uh, to life and property. If we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. So here's the current track right now as of uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time or 1 p.m. Central. Uh, again, it is a major hurricane as it approaches the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, it is uh, expected to continue a northwest track. There will be some interaction with the peninsula over the course of the next 24 hours. Uh, some other things that we expect this storm to do is the possibility that its wind field will expand and widen uh, over the course of the next day or two. Uh, that can have impacts both when it comes to the damaging wind swath and also when it comes to surge. So again, we're going to tell people uh, something that you've probably heard me say many times in these uh, press conferences is do not get enamored with the center line of the track as you see it here. If you are in the cone, you can be affected by life-threatening impacts and you need to prepare as such. Um, and that's really important as we are still uh, three to four days out here. Um, and so 20, 30 miles, 50 miles difference uh, can make all the difference like we saw with Laura, uh, you know, where the surge or the most of the surge hits, where the heaviest wind swath of damage hits. So we have to understand you don't have to be at the center line to see life-threatening impacts. And that's probably the number one takeaway right now. If you're in that cone, you need to prepare like you are going to see life-threatening impacts. If we go ahead and jump to the next slide. And so when are the earliest time that these uh, impacts could start? Well, when it comes for the winds, uh, you can see the earliest time here right now shows uh, roughly about Friday a.m. Now, this is the earliest reasonable time. Uh, if the storm slows down just a little bit, it could be later in the evening or as, even as late as, as Saturday early morning. But we want people to understand that your window to prepare starts to close on Friday. And so here we are standing on uh, the middle of uh, Tuesday afternoon uh, with the understanding that the, the window will close here in just a, a few days. And as I put, uh, put in that last bullet right there, you see the whole coastline is in play for uh, you know, tropical storm winds with chances up to 90% over uh, portions of the state's coastline. Uh, obviously, these chances will probably go up as we get a little bit more uh, certainty in the track and you'll see that also narrow down a little bit to the exact areas where we think the most damaging winds are possible. And we'll have a better feel for that over the course of the next 24 to 36 hours uh, as we get more information from the storm, from the hurricane hunters, and also from the National Hurricane Center. If we could jump to the next slide. Here's a quick look at the rainfall right now. Uh, an aerial average of about four to six inches is possible with locally higher amounts. Uh, that doesn't seem like a lot of rain, I know, but if you get that in a very short time frame and you get under one of the heavier bands, those amounts could be up to double. And that's where you could definitely start to see river flooding as well as uh, flash flooding. And uh, one of the big risks that anyone can take in a storm is actually trying to drive in those conditions, especially if it's nighttime. You have no idea how deep that water is. You have no idea how fast the water is moving. And if you're driving over bridges or culverts or anything like that, you don't even know if the road is still there. So it's a very dangerous situation, and that is one of the threats that we'll look for as we move further down the line and we get an idea, uh, a little bit more specifics about where we think this heavier rainfall may line up. If we could jump to the next slide. So key takeaways, again, we have uh, a major hurricane uh, approaching our shoreline in just a couple of days. Uh, we'll have much more when it comes to specifics 
of uh, where it's most likely to hit as we get uh, further down the road in the next 24 to 36 hours. Uh, we'll have a better feel for that after it passes the Yucatan Peninsula when we get to see what kind of interaction it has with that land and gets about back over the uh, warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the key uh, elements, that last one there, though we are looking at possible weakening to occur as it approaches the shoreline, I don't want everyone to use that as a reason to think that this is going to be something that's not going to create significant impacts to where you are or to where you live. Because again, if you are in that cone right now, uh, you are at risk for life-threatening impacts from Hurricane Delta. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Governor, and again, thank you. Thank you, man. As you can all plainly see, this is a very serious storm, a major hurricane, um, and as Ben mentioned, uh, the one thing we sort of like about this particular storm is its forward speed, and we don't want that to slow down. Uh, the faster it gets in and out of the area, the less rain that falls, the shorter the period of time that the wind is whipping at our buildings and homes and, and so forth, um, and, and also uh, hopefully the less surge. But all of those three things are going to be very uh, significant. We did just complete a unified command group meeting uh, at GOSEP. I can tell you that our state agencies uh, and our federal partners and our local partners are all preparing for Delta's impacts uh, on Louisiana. Um, and much of the work that has been done with the several storms that have come our way already remains in place in terms of sandbags and super sacks and, and other work that's, that's been done. Uh, but it's, it's a never-ending mission to move generators and pumps and to respond with additional sandbags and super sacks. And all that's ongoing as we speak. Uh, for example, CPRA is working with the town of Grand Isle to install 350 super sacks to protect critical areas on the Gulf side of the island uh, that were impacted uh, during Tropical Storm Beta. Uh, the National Guard is assisting with the installation of those super sacks. That mission will begin this evening. Uh, Grand Isle has also requested 11 pumps and five generators. We're working now to fulfill those requests. They are also working on Grand Isle to shore up the levee on the north side or the bay side of the island. The CPRA and the Terrebonne Levee District are proceeding with an operation to sink a barge near the location of the Grand Bayou Floodgate construction site. Uh, currently that site is being prepped uh, for this operation. Uh, Terrebonne is working 24 hours a day on uh, a day to lift a levee reach between Point of Chien and Montague. Uh, their goal is to reach a minimum elevation of 11 feet and lower the large east. Uh, this is outside the Morganza to the Gulf system. They're currently staging a large sandbagging operation to increase the elevation of lower portions of this levee, which are under construction to get it up to 11 to 12 feet. The St. Mary Levee District has also initiated an emergency contract to close the gap on the south side of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway around Bayou Sally under the Highway 317 bridge. The CPRA is providing predictive storm surge modeling to all levy authorities and coastal parishes to help them make the best possible and, and, and timely uh, decisions with respect to preparations uh, for this hurricane. They're also monitoring all 689 gates across the coastal zone, uh, 188 of which are closed as of this morning. As decisions are made over the next day or two or on evacuations, we will keep you updated. Obviously, it goes without saying that those areas outside the protected uh, areas down in, in coastal Louisiana are most uh, at risk. But we encourage everyone to be weather aware, pay attention to the weather forecasts, go to the National Weather Service website, uh, and also make sure that you follow the directions of your local elected officials. We know that there are a few parishes already discussing voluntary and mandatory evacuations of low-lying areas. Uh, and again, those announcements will come uh, over the next day or so. If you do have to evacuate or you choose to evacuate, uh, you can get updates on road closures um, from the Department of Transportation Development at 511LA.org. Uh, as of this morning, and we're getting back uh, to a COVID briefing now, um, but it, it, it interplays, uh, I'm sorry, this is a Laura briefing, but, but it, 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 COVID is, is uh, implicated, as is 
tropical storm um, uh, Hurricane Delta. Uh, right now we have 6,613 people who continue to shelter in Louisiana because of Hurricane Laura. And because of COVID, they continue to shelter in non-congregate shelters. Uh, we are consolidating the hotels down to 12 hotels. That'll be finished by tomorrow. 10 of those will be in New Orleans. One will be in the Baton Rouge area and one will be in the Lafayette area. At this time, there are not plans to move Hurricane Laura evacuees again uh, in advance of Hurricane uh, Delta. In light of the current forecast uh, for the storm, it does look like we will need to pause COVID testing on Friday and Saturday uh, in the New Orleans and greater Baton Rouge areas, but we will have more information about exactly where this testing will be paused uh, tomorrow and on Thursday. Uh, obviously, we're gonna continue to monitor the situation and keep you updated. We really hate turning off our COVID test uh, because it is really important for us to know uh, what's going on at any given time with respect to the transmission of the virus, uh, the positivity uh, of, of certain populations and, and all of that. And testing really is the way we, we uh, try to stay on top of that. Uh, so we will not turn it off any uh, more testing than is necessary and we will make sure that we resume testing as soon as we possibly can. Uh, while we're talking about COVID, I'll go over the numbers that we released for today. Um, that is 506 new positive test results. So that's 506 new cases on 12,760 tests. Uh, unfortunately, we're also reporting six new deaths today. Uh, currently, we have 567 uh, COVID patients in our hospitals. Uh, that number is up by 49 over the last two days. Um, it was up 29 yesterday and 20 uh, today. Uh, now, as I always say, a couple days doesn't necessarily make a trend, but we're keeping an eye on those hospitalization numbers because those are ground truth numbers. Those people are in the hospital, they've been diagnosed with, with COVID, and obviously we don't want the number of people in the hospital uh, with COVID to, to continue to increase. As you are aware, my current phase three order expires on Friday. We're gonna have an update for you on Thursday about the order that will replace it. Um, and of course on Thursday, we'll be giving you a lot of information, I suspect, as it relates to, to COVID, to, to Laura, and then principally on Hurricane Delta. Um, and as we said during Laura, and it, it bears repeating because it's incredibly important. We're going to be preparing for and responding to Hurricane Delta during a COVID public health emergency. And necessarily, whether we want it or not, there will be tens of thousands of people moving about the state of Louisiana, uh, either as voluntary or mandatory evacuations, as, as people who are pre-positioning uh, to make sure that we can restore power. Shortly after the storm, you're going to have people coming in and, and so forth. Uh, it is really important. Uh, that we do everything we can to follow all of the mitigation measures that are in place to slow the transmission of, of this virus and to reduce our cases and hospitalizations and obviously our deaths. Uh, I am very, very appreciative of all the people in Louisiana and by the way, of all the people who came into our state in order to help us respond to Hurricane Laura uh, because we have not seen as of yet uh, a surge in cases or in positivity. Uh, and, and so that means the mitigation measures do work. And it's really important that we continue to wear our mask or other face covering, especially when we are uh, in the presence of people who are not part of our immediate household. It's also important to maintain six feet of distancing uh, with people who are not part of your immediate household. Uh, it is really important to wash your hands frequently uh, with, with soap and water. Uh, if you're sick, stay home. And remember, we should always protect those who are most vulnerable to this disease. Those are people who are 65 and older, those people who have comorbid health conditions like heart disease, kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and so forth. Um, it is not too late. And in fact, we've been given a rare gift here uh, because this forecast uh, is telling us several days in advance that we can expect to be hit by a hurricane. The gift is the forewarning. 
So I'm encouraging everybody to use the time you have available to you between now and when it's too dangerous to continue to prepare or to evacuate to get yourself, your family, in the best possible position for this storm. If you haven't yet done so, go to getagameplan.org. Remember, you should plan as if the first 72 hours are on you uh, and that you should not anticipate receiving assistance within those 72 hours. Obviously, and you can see from the team that we continue to have assembled here, whether it's state police, national guard, fire marshal's office, wildlife and fisheries, uh, you name it, we're gonna get to you just as soon as we possibly can. Uh, but when you prepare, uh, you, should, you should have all of the supplies uh, and all the things in mind uh, that you will learn about if you go to getagameplan.org. And preparing for a storm in a COVID environment is unlike preparing uh, for a hurricane in other years. So just because you've done this in the past doesn't mean that you're properly situated and prepared for uh, this particular storm. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to updates from my office, uh, please text Hurricane Delta to 67283, Hurricane Delta to 67283. And Hurricane Delta is one word. Um, look, I know that another hurricane, another challenge, another disaster, another emergency is the last thing any one of us wanted to face uh, this season. Uh, this season uh, has been relentless. And in fact, uh, since early March, um, it just seems like one thing after another. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we don't get to pick and choose. This is the hand that we've been dealt. What we get to decide is how we play our hand, and we have to start playing it right now. And I want you to know we have a tremendous team of dedicated public servants who are going to be working around the clock to make sure that, that uh, people are as protected and cared for as possible. We just need you to do your part. So prepare for the worst, pray for the best. Uh, I do encourage everybody uh, uh, to pray for our state. Uh, our next pros, uh, press conference is scheduled tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. Uh, and, and that will follow another UCG meeting that I will have tomorrow. I do anticipate that before our meeting tomorrow, I will have submitted a pre-landfall declaration uh, request uh, to the president. Uh, and and I, will, I will certainly update you on that tomorrow at the press conference. So with that, I will pause and take questions for just a moment. Yes, sir. Greg? Governor, yeah. so, so we, we did. But the good news is many of the people, remember, we were evacuating, uh, uh, sheltering 18,000 people at one time. So those numbers are way down. We've consolidated uh, from more than 40 hotels into, uh, by the end of tomorrow, 12. And so non-congregate sheltering will continue to be the priority because of the COVID. And by non-congregate, we're basically talking about hotels. And it's too early to say exactly what the plan is because we don't know where the hurricane's going. Um, but, but it will be hotels somewhere uh, in the state of Louisiana, if at all possible. Um, and, and so uh, we will have more definition around that as the storm gets closer, because it's just too early to make those decisions. Uh, but it is a really good question. Uh, as of right now, we do not anticipate uh, any major mandatory evacuations from inside protected areas. Uh, so if you're looking, for example, at the greater New Orleans area, you're gonna have to get out into the Venetian Isles and so forth to see those people that we expect to be evacuated or, or people uh, in Plaquemines Parish who are outside the protective areas, maybe on the, on the east bank uh, of the river uh, near Bay Braithwaite and, and so forth. Uh, so we don't anticipate the mandatory evacuation of just huge numbers of people. That should help us uh, with the sheltering. And of course, we do have congregant sheltering available to us like the mega shelter in Alexandria uh, that will be set up and be available. We hope to use it much like we did during Laura as a way to stage evacuees so that they can maybe report there if necessary, but then we move them uh, to a non-congregant shelter just as quickly as possible. And of course, we always have to have a special needs shelter uh, set up for individuals who, who may require more care. Maybe they're medically fragile and that sort of thing. And so we'll be working on all of that over the next couple of days. Any other questions? Greg?
Well, as you can as you can imagine, uh, my my opinion of what some of them are doing ha is is not changed at all. I was against it yesterday and the day before. Uh, the fact of the matter is we've had a public health emergency in our country uh, and in the state of Louisiana since March. And you need all of the tools at, at your disposal in order to effectively and timely uh, manage that emergency and, and do everything that, that's necessary. And I know that there are some people who, who are tired of the virus, but that doesn't mean the, the virus is going to listen to that and leave us alone. And in fact, that's not happening anywhere around the country and in many places around the world. Uh, where numbers are actually starting to surge again. That hasn't started here in Louisiana, uh, thank God, uh, but it's certainly possible. Um, and, and so it would be sheer lunacy uh, to, to prematurely end the declaration of emergency and put at risk not just the funding that we receive from the federal government, but our ability uh, to respond as we need to, whether it's using the National Guard or, or the state police. Um, you know, we're, we're going to potentially be asking the president to approve, again, non-congregant sheltering. Well, the reason that is in order is because of the public health emergency. If we don't have a declared public health emergency, how can we ask him to approve the additional expense associated with sheltering people? You know, and, and there's so many other things that, that go into this, um, and, and it's, it's really... Um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's not a good idea uh, to, to pursue that. Um, I, I know that it is a minority of legislators who are pushing for it. Uh, the sooner that, that we resolve uh, these issues, the better, and restore the certainty that the people of Louisiana need. Uh, but I will tell you as governor, as the person in the state of Louisiana constitutionally charged with the authority but also the obligation to take care of the people of Louisiana, I will continue to do that. I will use every tool at uh, my disposal as necessary to do it, and I will surrender none of those tools uh, because people uh, have some unrealistic idea about this public health emergency. Yes, sir. Well. Uh, first of all, we have a lot of experience here in Louisiana, um, and it predates my governorship, but certainly since my governorship, we have a lot of experience with, with uh, natural disasters principally, um, but uh, more recently with the public health emergency too, with it, which has also involved the Unified Command Group. So literally every state agency in the governor's uh, office, uh, but also um, we have the uh, lieutenant governor, we have the the Secretary of State, the Commissioner of Insurance, the Attorney General, um, I mean, you, you name it. Uh, but we also hear from the Corps of Engineers and from the Coast Guard. Uh, John Long is here with us today. He's been embedded with us for many, many months now. So we actually have FEMA on the ground. And it really helps to have the communication and the coordination as early as possible so that, for example, by having those calls, uh, John gets to hear everything every state agency is contemplating and if something's going to require FEMA approval, or if he knows we're going to want uh, ask for FEMA reimbursement later, he can get with us on the front end and say, this is how you need to make that request. This is when you need to make that request. This is how you should go about that particular operation. But you should know that, that all of these agencies that I just talked about, they're not just on the call. They have an emergency support function that they are in charge of. It's, it's an ESF is what we call it. Um, and we're up to 17 ESFs. Uh, and so there are 17 uh, different agencies that formally brief their plan, their emergency support function uh, for that particular disaster. Uh, that's what we went through today. And, and of course, tomorrow we're going to have a UCG meeting again about uh, Hurricane Delta. But we've also told people you've got to also brief about what your current operations are with respect to continuing to respond to and recover from Laura, uh, but also with respect to COVID. And so we're going to have three different disasters that we'll be, we'll be briefing uh, tomorrow. But we have a, a really good team. Uh, they're, they're committed, dedicated public servants. And, and I brag on them. I think we have the best anywhere in the country, uh, both because they're good people, but also because we have way more than our fair share of experience. We just do this too often. But having that experience is a good thing when you need to draw upon it.
And that's why I'm, I'm very confident as we head into this storm or anything else that we have the very best team in the country uh, to deal with it. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, th there, is, there is some of that going on. It's two things. Uh, there are people who are being relocated back to their homes in southwest Louisiana if they have um, minor, moderate damage in the homes of livable. Uh, so that could be what's at play. Uh, secondly, there, there is an effort right now to consolidate hotels. Uh, as you recall, at the maximum, we had 42 individual hotels, the vast majority in New Orleans. I think 36 or some, some, uh, uh, some number like that were in New Orleans. We're in the process now, uh, DCFS working with the Red Cross, and the Red Cross is actually in charge of, of these hotels, these non congregate sheltering, of condensing that down to a total of 12 hotels, 10 in New Orleans, one in Baton Rouge, one in Lafayette. So I don't know whether they're being told they have to leave to go home because they're, they've done the work to find out that they can and should go home, or, or whether they're just being consolidated into another hotel. Uh, but, but they should contact the Red Cross and get those questions answered. Um, and, but it's important that we do this because as you have a small enough number of individuals, you shouldn't have them spread across too many hotels because it makes it exponentially harder and more costly uh, to feed them uh, and to also to be able to communicate with them and give them the information that they need about what the situation is back home, whether it's in Cameron Parish or, or in Calcasieu Parish, you name it. Uh, so that's just part of the normal process that, that we go through. Um, but if they have any questions, uh, they, they, should, they should contact the, the Red Cross people or the DCF folks at their hotel. Yes, sir. Sam? Well, obviously, if you look at that cone, um, the Cameron and Calcasieu parishes, uh, uh, those areas are in the cone. Um, the center line track continues to be uh, in the Morgan City area. Uh, that may change a little bit as of the next uh, update. So it's certainly possible. Um, it's more likely, as we talked today, that, that uh, southwest Louisiana will be on the left or on the west side of, of the uh, hurricane as it makes landfall, which is a good thing. Not to say there won't be destructive winds, and not to say that they won't get rainfall, but as you know, the, the west side of that storm is always uh, better than the east side. Um, but they're in no shape right now to withstand a storm because of all the damage that, can, that they sustained in, in Hurricane Laura uh, and that we continue to try to, to recover uh, from. I can tell you that with respect to power, for example, um, when I left a while ago, it looked like about 98% of Calcasieu Parish has electricity restored. However, many of the redundant sources of electricity are not yet available, uh, and the largest transmission lines continue to be uh, repaired and replaced. Uh, that's going to have to pause for, for a while as the hurricane uh, approaches, uh, and then those crews will go back out and continue that work. Uh, so, so while 99% of the most populous parish that, that was affected by Laura has electricity, the redundancy is not yet there, uh, and that doesn't impact the residents as much as it does the businesses, especially the heavy industrial businesses, the refineries, and so forth, that, that need that redundancy there because of all the implications of a power outage that cannot be uh, quickly addressed. Um, with respect to the water systems, all the water systems are operational. Uh, I don't believe any remain on generator power. They're all using um, um, standard power being provided primarily by Entergy, but by the other electric uh, providers as well. Uh, so, but there's a long way to go in southwest Louisiana uh, to recover from Hurricane Laura. There's no doubt about that. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were uh, just in the process of having uh, some temporary uh, homes, uh, travel trailers and so forth, moved into southwest Louisiana um, and that, that'll continue for another day or so, I guess, but, but then they're going to have to suspend that until uh, this particular threat is, is passed. But it, your question's a good one, and it underscores the fact that we continue to recover uh, from Hurricane Laura. Um, and as we look forward to uh, Delta, not in a good way, as if we just 
uh, excited about Delta coming, uh, it helps us, I think, to remember that the strongest storm to make landfall in Louisiana since 1856 was Hurricane Laura. Uh, we don't want anything like that uh, with respect to this next one. Yes, sir. Greg, one more question. Uh, it is my intention to be there, yes. Um, so for those of you who didn't hear, the question was about uh, the funeral service for uh, former Governor Mike Foster. Uh, that'll be down in St. Mary Parish. I do intend to go. That's why I'm going to have a UCG meeting here in the morning. I will go for the, uh, the funeral service and then return here for a press conference uh, tomorrow afternoon. And, and I do want to end uh, by discussing just a little bit about Mike Foster. He was a tremendous public servant, two-term governor of the state of Louisiana. He served before that as a state senator, uh, made many, many contributions, um, and, and particularly in my mind happened to do with, with higher ed, with a tremendous expansion of TOPS, uh, with uh, the very generous and stable funding for higher education that grew over the course of his eight years, and then the creation of the Louisiana Community Technical College System. Uh, so he was certainly an individual who understood the value of higher education and what it means uh, to the future of the state uh, and, and somebody in that respect that we should all, uh, first of all, be, be appreciative of and, and thankful for, but also seek to emulate uh, as we move forward because the, the key to success really hasn't changed since then. Uh, we need a better educated citizenry it, and education is the mortal enemy of poverty. He knew that. Um, and so we shouldn't have to relearn that lesson. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing all that we can to, to educate our kids uh, as, as best we can. So with that, I want to thank all of you. Uh, I'll see you at 3.30 tomorrow. And again, I'll prepare for the worst and pray for the best. Thank you.